I'm going to tell you a story about Mr. Smith. I don't know his real name, but we're going to call him Mr. Smith for today. Now, Mr. Smith was admitted to hospital a few years back. After a successful operation for rectal cancer, he was transferred to the ward. Despite sweating profusely and being nil by mouth, he wasn't given any intravenous fluids. And later that day, his family found him trying to wash himself, and he'd been given no pain relief. Two days later, Mr. Smith wasn't passing any urine, and so he was transferred to the high dependency unit, where he wasn't monitored regularly. His wife was informed that he was suffering from acute renal failure and would need to be transferred to the intensive treatment unit, where he started to receive dialysis. The following day, the dialysis machine broke, and there was a delay in getting authorization to replace it. Mr. Smith was informed that metastases had been found in his lymph nodes and he would need to begin a course of chemotherapy. Three days later, Mr. Smith came back to the ward. He was given no help with eating and his chest pains were ignored. Staff were unable to check his blood pressure because of faulty equipment. And very sadly, Mr. Smith passed away 45 minutes later. His family was given no explanation by the hospital as to the cause of his death. And no metastases were found at the post-mortem. Now, Mr. Smith was in Stafford Hospital in the West Midlands region of the UK back in 2005. His experience includes a whole range of serious problems in medical and diagnostic care, in nursing care, and very poor hospital management. And his story is one, very sadly, of many anonymous cases included by Robert Francis QC in his independent inquiry on what happened at Stafford Hospital, which many of you will know about. And Stafford felt particularly raw for me because it was very near to the home of my elderly grandparents at the time, who may well have needed that hospital. Now, recently, I spent some time volunteering as a hospital manager in Sierra Leone, West Africa, with the King's Sierra Leone Partnership, which is part of King's Health Partners. And this experience prompted me to think in whole new directions about quality improvement in healthcare. This is the view from outside the hospital where I worked. And sadly, but not unexpectedly, poor quality care is a major challenge for hospitals in Sierra Leone as well. And the most startling evidence I was able to find of this was in the 2016 maternal deaths surveillance and response data for the country. And this data tells us that a huge 80% of maternal deaths in Sierra Leone are taking place inside healthcare facilities. Many women are dying after spending significant time in the facility. Many deaths follow a cesarean section. Ultimately, many of these deaths are avoidable, and they are a stark reminder to us all that care access alone is far from the full solution. It must be access to reliably high-quality care, or people needlessly die. Now, healthcare is an inherently risky business wherever in the world we are, and working in health in an affluent country in no way removes the risk of care being unsafe or of poor quality. Indeed, much of the research these days into improving patient safety focuses on the human factors in healthcare errors, which therefore apply the world over. But don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that the huge differences in numbers of staff, availability of equipment, drugs, supplies, and access to clinical education don't play a major role in keeping us all safe, because they absolutely do. But it's because of these core human factors that there's a huge opportunity for mutual learning between healthcare systems in very different countries. And indeed, I would argue it's more than an opportunity, it's an imperative. Because after all, what's at stake here is keeping people alive. Keeping people alive and well 
and able to live the full lives that they want to lead. Now, thankfully, there is hope as well as horror. Hope and horror. And for me, there's a deep truth in John Ruskin's comment that quality is never an accident. It's always the result of intelligent effort. Now, in my spare time, I'm an enthusiastic violinist. I play in various groups, and over the years, I've come to the conclusion that a really great hospital has so much in common with a really great orchestra. Now, as a seven-year-old, rather screechy violinist in my first ever junior orchestra, one of the first things I learned, perhaps somewhat to my surprise, was that it wasn't all about me. So every section of the orchestra is dependent on the others. That really exquisite solo in the oboes is just nowhere near as good without that wonderful soft harmony behind it in the strings. And sometimes it's just not your turn to play. And you not only have to wait, you actually have to count the right number of bars rest and come back in at the right time. Something I've often got wrong, plonking, as they say in the trade, much to the amusement of my neighbouring players. And let's be honest, there's a fair amount of this plonking in the NHS too. Then, of course, there's the conductor whose leadership brings all of the players together. We need this in the NHS as well. So, as people in the complex business of trying to improve health and healthcare, how do we really know how often we do actually do the right thing by the people we're trying to help? And therefore, how easy the system makes it for us to do just that? Now, that's where really great data and governance comes in, because without the right qualitative and quantitative data, we can't prove that we have the best possible outcomes for the people we're trying to help in this imperfect system with limited resources. Now, my favourite experience of working for better systems for data and governance was while I was working over in Sierra Leone. I worked at Connaught Hospital in Freetown, which is the country's largest adult referral hospital. And there I worked with the hospital managers, clinicians and health records team earlier this year to put in place a really effective system for patient records. Together, we transformed several offices worth of loose paper, which was unindexed episodic records, into a really effective system of lifelong records for each patient. In the new system, each patient is issued when they first come to the hospital with a unique patient identifier based on their chiefdom of birth, their initials and a serial number. All their records are placed into a single folder for life, correctly stored and indexed and retrieved each time clinicians need them. These are the, some of the smart folders that we created and introduced together. And here they are, beautifully stored on the shelves in the health records team's office. And here you see the health records team themselves. They, the hospital clinicians and managers, all made outstanding contributions to getting this new system up and running in a more than 300-bedded hospital in six short months. And I'd really like to thank them for their brilliant contributions. Now, thanks to the new system, Connaught staff can now see by week and month exactly who, who was admitted to the hospital and what happened to them. That might not sound like much, but it's actually incredibly powerful because it enables them to see on an ongoing basis how successful various improvement projects actually are. So just as an example, there's a major focus at the moment on using early warning scores in inpatient care to make sure that the sickest and deteriorating patients get rapid attention. And through good record keeping, we've been able to evidence that proper vital sign monitoring has increased from a baseline of just 5% in December 2016 to a huge 84% just eight months later in July 2017. This is a fantastic achievement 
And let us not forget, it's exactly this kind of improvement which saves the lives of people like Mr. Smith. So this team have made an absolutely brilliant contribution and their work and that of their colleagues is helping towards getting the hospital re-accredited by the West African College of Physicians, which will mean more doctors in training at the hospital, which is a, a, a fantastic thing and something that they should all be rightly proud of. So moving back to the UK for a moment, the National Health Service is increasingly grappling with population health improvement in a world where long-term conditions are ever more prevalent. England has 15 academic health science networks, one of which I work for, Health Innovation Network in South London. And the job of these networks is to catalyse partnerships between all the players, hospitals, GPs, researchers, educators, digital health innovators, the industry, universities, all these different players to make real improvement. And we call it speeding up the best in health and care. And with this background, I was absolutely fascinated earlier this year to witness the early development of the University of Sierra Leone Teaching Hospitals Complex, which is a collaboration between 11 hospitals across the country, the medical nursing and pharmacy schools, and the Ministry of Health. Now, it struck me that both of these collaborations, the academic health science networks in England and the teaching hospitals complex in Sierra Leone, both have the same purpose, which is to consistently improve health through collaboration. They're both trying to answer two key questions, which are firstly, why is there still so much variation in practice when the evidence is often clear about what works? And secondly, how can we tackle this, this variation together? I'd like to share with you two examples of how these collaborations are starting to approach these questions, both of which just happen to relate to medicines. So while I was working at Connaught, we started a project to make sure that people with malaria, which, let's not forget, is still one of the biggest killers in the country, to make, make sure that these people always get access to the right medication at the right time to save more lives. And when we started looking at the data, we found a whole variety of reasons why this wasn't always happening, from supply problems with drugs and supplies on the one hand, to, on the other hand, clinicians just not always following the international treatment guidelines. We heard from staff that it had been hard for them to get access to the right things, and that until those problems were addressed, it would be very hard for staff to change their own behaviour. So the Malaria Project started to work on what we call process improvement in pharmacy and diagnostics. In other words, make it easier for the clinicians to get access to the right stuff, and they're more likely to do the right thing, which is a key lesson for any improvement work. And it struck me that this was actually remarkably similar to various medicines projects I've been involved with back home. One example being about access to insulin pump therapy in type 1 diabetes. Many of you will know that insulin pumps are a device with really strong evidence behind them that just aren't used as widely as they should be in this country. So I helped to run a collaborative of 10 hospitals across London where we worked with clinical staff and their managers to discover exactly what were the barriers to using more insulin pumps. And then we worked together to tackle those barriers one by one. We know that when used correctly, insulin pumps can really transform the lives of people with type 1 diabetes. So we're incredibly proud that through our work, we've shown an increase of more than 40% on our baseline usage of insulin pumps, and we're starting to approach the level recommended by the evidence. Just one example of our work to speed up the best in health and care. Now, people often ask me what I learned in Freetown and brought back to the NHS, and I generally say two main things. Firstly a sharpened sense of the need to always ask what really matters. Now, while sweating in the 30-degree heat of Connaught Hospital in a crowded medical records office full of loose paper, I realised 
I needed to become much more self-reliant on the evidence I was able to personally gather to tell me what really matters and what I could best do to contribute towards achieving that. And with far fewer standard processes and hierarchies around, that was really important. My second major piece of learning was about partnerships, how essential they are for sustainable change and how we must keep going with partnerships even when they feel really difficult and uncomfortable, which in my experience, all partnerships do at some point. I felt the whole experience taught me to be more confident and autonomous in assessing for, from a variety of approaches to solving a problem which one was likely to be more effective. So this is how we can lift the orchestra from being more than just an analogy for a single hospital to being about the whole health and care system and working together to make this system as in tune with itself as is the Berlin Philharmonic. Ultimately, all of this work is about bringing very different people together who've had long experiences of things not working and supporting them to say, OK, this isn't working. Where do we need to get to? And how can we work together to get there? And for the sake of all the Mr. Smiths and their families across the world, this vitally important work must continue. Thank you.